Welcome to the online presentation about Andrew Jackson. Uh, it's the newest unit we're doing in social studies. I'm trying this on my iPad on this new program I got where I can uh, annotate the screen. And I'm going to have you do this at home uh, so that we don't have to spend the time in class doing this. Um, so bear with me. This is the first time I've used the iPad to try this, but I think it's going to be pretty cool. I've given you a handout in class that has questions on it for you to use as the presentation goes through. Uh, it goes chronologically slide by slide, so you shouldn't have any problem. The first thing I want to make sure we do, though, is just review real quick the McCullough versus Maryland Supreme Court case uh, that we have done in class already. Uh, but it's really important because it kind of sets the tone for Andrew Jackson's presidency, I think, uh, because he deals with this. The major issue during his presidency is this, this idea of settling the, the federalism concept in our Constitution between who has most of the power, the states or the federal government. And so if you remember, we've looked at before, the first National Bank of the United States uh, was established, and its charter wasn't renewed under Jefferson, who thought that the government should basically be limited to a post office. But after the War of 1812, we kind of ended up in an economic depression, and people called for another bank. So we had the second bank in the United States established. And if you remember, some of the states, some of the private businesses, especially some of the private banks, didn't like competing with the federal bank. And so one of those states, Maryland, in this little, little cartoon we have, um, they decided to put a $15,000 tax on the branch in their state. And the branch in that state just said, we're not going to pay the tax. And so they went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and uh, John Marshall, the man who was responsible for the Marbury versus Madison Supreme Court case, ruled on this one as well. And there were two questions uh, that were brought to the court. And those were, can the federal government make a national bank by, legally by the Constitution? And then, if so, can Maryland tax a United States federal bank? So this is what we did in class when I had you actually pretend like you were the Supreme Court and decide on these two questions. And I, actually... A lot of you did a great job and came up with the right answers. Um, but just to review those, in the first question, uh, could the government establish a national bank? That answer was yes. Uh, there's a clause in the Constitution in section eight, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18. It's the, the last part of the powers given to Congress says that Congress can make any laws necessary and proper uh, to execute the foregoing powers. All the powers they list before, they're like coining money and uh, allowing to take loans out on the nation's credit. Um, John Marshall in the Supreme Court said, that is necessary and proper. Uh, a bank can help us do that. The second question, though, was, can Maryland tax the branch, the National Bank, within their borders? So he said it, the bank could exist, but could a state tax it? And the answer to that one was a resounding no. Uh, there's a key clause in the Constitution that's now known as the Supremacy Clause. It's Article 6, Section 2, and it says that if there are two laws made in the United States, one of them at state level and one of them at the federal level, and they conflict, well, then the federal law uh, supersedes the state law. Um, the federal law is the supreme law of the land, and cannot uh, a state law cannot supersede it. And the other one of the things he talks about, and it's a hard concept to understand, but the famous quote is that, with the power to tax comes the power to destroy, and a state government could not destroy a federal institution. The biggest thing that I want you to get from this, though, is right here. Uh, the, the two things that really come from this is what's important. It really solidified the power of the federal government over the states, and this will carry out, and it will still be a battle uh, in that concept, and it leads all the way up to the Civil War, but what it does is it the implied powers uh, of the Constitution are established uh, the, the Congress can stretch their powers as long as uh, the means uh, to the laws they make uh, coincide with the powers given to it in the Constitution, and that the federal law is supreme over state laws. Uh, this slide is just kind of an overview of the highlights of the age of Jackson itself, uh, with some of the things that he did, some of the good things, and then also some of the not-so-good things. Um, but he did serve two terms as president, 
and he's considered the first common man president, uh, and he accomplished several big things uh, in American history. Um, some of the big ones that we'll focus on uh, deal with the bank, the second bank itself that we just talked about, um, the spoil system right here, and one of the big ones here is the removal of Native Americans off their land and, and the nullification crisis uh, that happens twice. Uh, and I, this picture right here uh, is really funny. If you notice, he's holding the smoking pistol. He was known to uh, not shy away from duels if someone challenged him, uh, and he was in several of them. In fact, they say he died with a significant amount of lead in his body. So to begin with itself with Jackson was just his election uh, in 1828. Um, after John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, who was the second president of the United States, uh, was president and defeated him in the election of 1824, there was a lot of scandal. There was actually a thing called the corrupt bargain that happened that kind of put a, a shadow on John Quincy Adams' presidency. And so in the next, next election, people weren't too fond of him, and Jackson's going to actually win the presidency. He was not uh, a fan of uh, the elite people in our society, people that were uh, born into wealth, because they tended to be the ones that stayed in power. And he didn't see that as democracy. Um, that was just the rich ruling uh, the working class, essentially. Uh, one of the big things, though, that happened during Jackson's time, and it wasn't Jackson himself that did this, but that voting rights were expanded. Uh, suffrage, we've heard that word before, the right to vote. Um, still not to women, uh, or to African Americans, but before this time, we learned in Kansas history, it really required you uh, to own land, to be white, a male, to be white and own land. Uh, but the big thing that was taken away from that was the requirement to own land. And so a lot more people could vote. And those people that did not own land really supported Jackson, uh, and they got him into office. So when Jackson was elected, though, Tons of people showed up for his inauguration ceremony at the White House, and it was a crazy party, and thousands of people showed up, and what happened was, is actually, it kind of turned into a house party uh, on the lawn of the White House. Windows were broken, um, furniture in the White House was broken, and actually it had to be cleared out uh, by force uh, to get people out of there, and so a lot of people, rich people, saw this as a trampling of the presidency and the government. We better get out of here, it's getting a little loud. One of the first thing that Jackson did when he got into office was um, highly practice uh, this idea of the spoils system. And it wasn't anything terribly new, uh, but he was a person who highlighted it and wasn't afraid to say that's what he was doing. And what it was, uh, was when you came into office as president, you replaced uh, government officials in charge with your political supporters. Um, something that people did, but it was kind of, you know, just a hush-hush kind of thing. He was just the first one to defend it. And Jackson just felt that uh, rotating office holders made the government itself more responsive to the public will. It was more of a, a democracy. You know, if the people voted him in, well, they must have wanted people that believed in what he believed in in office. And you know, the famous saying is, to the victor belong the spoils. So he won office, he's going to do what he wants to do with the uh, people who hold political office. At the very start of Jackson's presidency, uh, he had to face the question of the correct division of independence between uh, state governments and central governments. The slave South feared federal power a ton, uh, no state more than South Carolina, uh, probably the largest uh, farming uh, state and also uh, the strongest uh, slavery uh, supporter and the most slavery concentration in the Union at that time was in South Carolina. Um, one of the big things was that Southerners hated the idea of protectionist tariffs right here. And we've talked about that before. After the War of 1812, uh, British manufacturers and merchants started dumping their goods uh, into the American markets for a much lower price than American goods were. In fact, some British uh, people wanted to try and destroy the economy of the United States by doing this, and in fact, they did do some of that. And so the United States passed 
a series of tariffs to help protect uh, American manufacturing, well, you know that most of that was concentrated in the North. Uh, and that was really great for them because that made it so that uh, the goods, American goods, were cheaper because it, the tariff posed a tax on imported goods from, like, Britain. And so it made their goods cheaper, the American goods. And so people would buy them and improve their economy. Um, but Southerners did not like that uh, because they had to pay more for manufactured goods and being able to buy the cheap ones from Britain like they were used to. And so this again brings up this idea of nullification. That a state, if they feel uh, that a law passed by Congress or the federal government is unconstitutional uh, or they just don't want to go by it, they can nullify it. They can get rid of it, void it. Uh, and that one of the big people that was uh, prominent in that was John C. Calhoun, who was actually the vice president uh, to Andrew Jackson at the time. Uh, the biggest argument for nullification was this concept right here uh, of states' rights. Uh, that this country was formed in the idea of keeping powers and rights with the states. Uh, and the idea is that because the people gave power to the Constitution, uh, it was the states that, that voted uh, to establish the Constitution, so it was the states uh, that gave the power to the Constitution, not so much the individual people. We weren't a whole. Remember, at this time, I said that if someone was from Massachusetts, they're more than likely to say they were a, uh, from Massachusetts first, and then they were a, an American second. Okay, this was very big in the South. The argument against nullification uh, was obviously most clearly supported in northern states and northern congressmen, uh, such as Daniel Webster here, who said that the United States government was not uh, given its power by the states. Uh, but by the American people itself. Now that we were all Americans uh, and that we are all responsible under the federal government to abide by the regulations it sets uh, and that nullification itself can hamper the government because if you have disunion uh, then you're not at your full strength and potential. And uh, with John C. Calhoun, the big uh, leader of this concept of nullification from South Carolina as vice president to Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson did not support this idea. Uh, in fact, at a dinner party, Andrew Jackson stood up and made a point by saying, our federal union, it must and shall be preserved. And John C. Calhoun stood up and said, the federal union next to our liberty, the most dear. Making his statement clear. And this actually um, created a big rift between the president and vice president and would cause John C. Calhoun to resign as vice president and go back to his state uh, of South Carolina to take up his post again in Congress. Congress again passed another tariff in 1832, what actually reduced some tariffs but still kept uh, many of the tariffs at a higher rate that uh, some Southerners didn't want to uh, pay. And actually, uh, most Southerners were okay with the idea of the tariffs because they didn't like the idea of uh, supporting the British economy, but South Carolina itself, uh, a very important state um, due to its agricultural um, prowess, uh, it was very key to our economy, uh, they said, uh, no way, and they weren't going to have any of this, and of course that idea of nullification comes back. And actually, in their eyes, uh, their constitutional right to control their lives had basically been sacrificed to the demands of uh, northern industry, and they didn't want any part of that. And so John C. Calhoun officially resigns as vice president, and South Carolina threatens to secede uh, from the federal government uh, if they don't get rid of the tariffs. Of course, Jackson quickly steps in. Uh, he's very furious that South Carolina is going to do this, and he asks for two things. Okay, uh, that the federal government be allowed to collect the tariff by force if necessary. In fact, he gets Congress to, port to, to pass a force bill uh, that will allow them to collect the uh, duties before the ships even get to South Carolina. Um, and he also said, you know, he kind of extended an olive branch, um, even though he was so furious, to get Congress to lower the tariffs to hopefully, you know, bring South Carolina uh, back to the negotiation table. And Congress did accept them, and South Carolina does repeal 
the tariff nullification and the crisis is averted. But the main important thing in this is that this idea of states' rights uh, and nullification is going to keep cropping up and will lead on to uh, the bloody dispute we know of the Civil War. The next uh, big situation that Andrew Jackson faced was what has become known as the Bank War. And this has to do with, you guessed it, uh, the second bank of the United States. Now, keep in mind, while the bank was chartered by the federal government, it's actually a private entity. Uh, it's run by um, a, a board and a president, and they're profit -se a profit-seeking uh, company. And they controlled, actually, the uh, state banks themselves. And if you guess it, the states didn't like that at all. We've talked about that. They had to compete with this bank that had lots of other privileges. And Jackson actually referred to the bank as the monster itself. Uh, he thought that it just benefited the money interests and the elite uh, and just made them richer uh, and put the little man down, if you say. Uh, farmers and merchants, uh, they especially hated the National Bank because during the panic of 1819 and after the War of 1812, the bank refused to extend any credit to these people who needed it during this hard time. And so they also saw it as a corrupt institution. In fact, the leader of the bank, Nicholas Biddle, was seen as a very corrupt uh, person from the North, and so was very much hated in the South. Um, what happened was, is the bank uh, was going to be up for rechartering in 1836, uh, which was several years away, uh, but Henry Clay, a prominent politician uh, who supported the bank because he was a northerner, he supported manufacturing and wanted to see it exist, uh, convinced Nicholas Biddle to ask for an early rechartering of the bank. Uh, and Andrew Jackson, uh, they thought they were going to trick him, I guess. Uh, but Andrew Jackson clearly said no, and he vetoed uh, the early charter for the bank when it came to him. Uh, what actually happened was that when he was re-elected, Andrew Jackson... He immediately withdrew uh, the federal funds from the National Bank and put them into state chartered banks uh, because without federal money in the second bank, uh, it just shriveled away. Uh, and when the charter expired in 1836, uh, it became just a regular Pennsylvania chartered private bank where the main branch was. And actually five years after uh, it became just a regular bank, it actually went bankrupt. So this is Jackson... Uh, this picture actually shows right here him, a political cartoon, slaying the bank. And that was one of his biggest triumphs. He wanted to get rid of that, uh, what he considered a corrupt institution. The next event here in Andrew Jackson's presidency, uh, the Indian removal uh, from the tribes in uh, the south just across the Appalachian Mountains, uh, right here, if I point out my pen, the Cherokee... Uh, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, uh, to the west across the Mississippi River it was a pretty important moment in his presidency, but I want you to understand it didn't start with him. Andrew Jackson definitely was racist towards Native Americans. In fact, he kind of gained his fame for being a uh, fighter of uh, Native Americans. He fought many battles against Native Americans and won quite often. Uh, this actually started with President James Monroe. Uh, after he left office, he recommended that we send the Native Americans clear across uh, the Mississippi River. And so uh, it was two presidents later that it gets to Andrew Jackson where this actually happens. Andrew Jackson wanted it too uh, because he liked the idea of opening up the land for white settlement. Uh, clearly in our minds today it's, you know, it's, a, it's a tragedy to the Native Americans who had lived on that land. Um, but we can't change the past. Uh, we just hope to not do anything like that ever again. The interesting part about this is that Chief Justice John Marshall, the man we've discussed in Marbury v. Madison and McCullough v. Maryland, uh, came down with two rulings uh, about Indian removal in Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, uh, as well as Worcester v. Georgia, uh, where he said himself, the Supreme Court said that Native Americans are not part of the United States and they're not a foreign nation. Uh, while they don't have any standing in federal courts, they cannot be forced to give up their land uh, unless they, you know, voluntarily give it up. And it's one of the famous sayings from Jackson is that he said, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Basically, you know, saying, I don't really care what you say, I'm going to do what I want. 
Uh, and he did get Congress to pass the Indian Removal Act uh, of 1830 and required the, the money to forcefully remove all these Native Americans uh, from those southern states uh, for white settlement. And one of my uh, favorite people to read, uh, which hopefully we'll have time to read at least something from him, is Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, who actually saw this when he was visiting Memphis. And I'm going to read what he said about this forced removal that he witnessed. He said, The wounded, the sick, newborn babies, and the old men on the point of death, I saw them embark to cross the great river. And the sight will never fade from my memory. Neither sob nor complaint rose from that silent assembly. Their afflictions were of long standing, and they felt them to be irremediable. The Cherokee, who were in mainly in present-day Georgia, uh, was one of the Native American tribes that, you know, really fought the uh, forced removal uh, of their tribe from their homeland. But uh, what they did uh, petition the government, uh, but they were unsuccessful. And after Andrew Jackson left office, um, Martin Van Buren, who was president then, ordered federal troops to forcefully remove them. Um, during the winter, which is the big thing, uh, in 1838 and 1839, uh, with very little supplies, they were undersupplied, they weren't given uh, proper food rations and uh, clothing to make the trip. And because of that, you know, this is probably the one, the statistic here that stands out the most to you. Uh, oh, well, that one and this one. That 4,000 of them died uh, on what became known as the Trail of Tears. Uh, you know, about a quarter of them died on this trail. And that's just the Cherokee. Um, thousands of other Native Americans died in forced removal and forced conflict uh, caused by Native American, or, I'm sorry, uh, white settlement uh, into this lust for agricultural land by southern farmers, mainly. And the impact on these, all of these tribes uh, that were forcibly moved, um, in the West, they encountered alien environments. They did not have their uh, traditional lands that they were on. Uh, the animals and plants they were unfamiliar with. Um, we've talked about this before. And so it just, they had to try and find new ways to live. And some of them uh, couldn't figure it out. A lot of intertribal conflicts uh, because it was so stressful. If you can imagine how that would be to be forced uh, to remove from where you had grown up all your life, knowing. Uh, your environment to a place that was um, completely alien to you uh, would be a shock to anyone's system. This last slide is just covering some of the uh, major impacts of Andrew Jackson's presidency. Uh, the big one here, the first one here, you know, the executive branch was greatly strengthened. Uh, his use of the veto power of presidents that we've talked about, uh, he used it quite often. Uh, he did not use it sparingly. If he wanted to use it, he was going to use it. Uh, the last thing we talked about there was the loss of land by Native Americans. Uh, and again, later on, we'll see that they will lose more land after that. Uh, the common man, which is a phrase that comes from this time, uh, gains power uh, and is going to vote more and be more involved in uh, the government in general. Uh, the Bank of the United States was destroyed again by Andrew Jackson. One of the things I don't mention here is that when he removed the money from the bank itself, uh, he was actually the only president uh, to get us completely out of debt. We had a positive balance, a net worth, if that's what you want to call it, in the United States. The only president to ever do that, there's a trivia question for you if you ever see that uh, on Jeopardy. That's the answer. And the big one here, though, North and South continue to grow apart. Uh, this will be the defining issue of the 19th century that we are discussing in 8th grade social studies. Uh, the nullification crisis, the conflict, the, the idea and the concept of states' rights uh, will boil up to the Civil War uh, with the same issues. Uh, we will see you all later. Uh, get that, those questions done with this uh, PowerPoint video. You can rewind it and go back to any parts you want. And also I'll have just the uh, PDF slides up as well for you to utilize.